The Nobel laureate <clears throat> Francois Jacob says that the human brain is, and this is a quote, hardwired for order. What does that mean? He believes that the human brain is created by a genetic blueprint that creates an organ that does not tolerate, does not like chaos or disorder. And if you've ever been to a party in a strange city where you don't know anyone and someone takes you to it, and you don't know anyone at the party and all kinds of weird things are happening, fights are breaking, I don't know, that's the kind of party I seem to end up at. <laughs> anyway, it, you know, when things are happening around and, and you don't know what the heck's happening, it's terrifying. Human beings, thanks, don't like chaos or disorder. So the human brain immediately attempts to create order out of the world around it. And the earliest human beings began to recognize very quickly that there were regularities, there were patterns in nature that were repeatable and predictable. The tides came and went according to the lunar cycle. Day followed night followed day. The seasons came. The animals migrated certain ways. Humans recognized these regularities. And as they looked out on the world, they began to see how things worked and began to, to use this ordered world that they had created. Every people has what anthropologists call a worldview. I call it culture. It's the collective, the sum total of all of the, the dreams and the songs and the prayers and the insights and the speculation and superstitions. All of that is what makes up a worldview. The, to me, what's interesting about a worldview is in a worldview, everything is connected to everything else. Nothing exists outside of it. And if you live in a world that is exquisitely interconnected, then it means everything that we do as a part of that world has repercussions. And therefore, everything we do carries responsibilities. And I've been privileged to spend over 30 years now working with Aboriginal people, not only in Canada, but around the world. And whenever I go into a, a native community for the first time, I try to listen, to just sit and listen. Listen to the stories and the songs and the prayers. And all over the world, it's the same. People celebrate that they are a part of nature. They give thanks to their creator for nature's generosity and abundance. They, uh, they, uh, they recognize that they are a part of nature and that what they do affects nature, and therefore they acknowledge they have responsibilities. And they promise over and over again to behave the right way to keep it all going. That's the way it's always been. And among traditional peoples around the world, that continues to be the way it is. But for the vast majority of people now living in cities, in modern societies, industrial societies, that sense of interconnectedness has been lost. And I believe this is the crisis that we face, is that we now live in a shattered world that we look out on as a mosaic of bits and pieces that are not connected in any way. So if we live in a shattered world, then there's no way that we can see how we are interacting with those various parts of the world, and therefore we don't have any sense of responsibility. How did we come to live in a shattered world when for most of human existence we had a completely different understanding. Well, I'm not a sociologist, but I, I, I could, would speculate that a few things that have led to this shattering of the world are rather obvious. For one thing, population. For 99% of human existence, if you were to plot on a curve, uh, on, with, uh, on a graph, where the x-axis is 150,000 years, and the y-axis is the number of people in billions, for 99% of that time, the curve rises barely perceptibly. It looks flat. And it's only in the last pencil width of time, around 1830, that you finally get to the first time when we've got about a billion people. It then takes over 100 years to reach the second, a doubling to two billion. When I was born in 1936, there were about two billion people. In my lifetime, the population of the planet has tripled. So what, if you graph that on a curve, that means that the inflection starts, as I said, in the last 
pencil width of time, and now it's leaping straight off the page. Now, I'm not going to go into the question of how much can the Earth carry and all that. But the important thing is, as that curve begins to leap off the page, it means that the average age of the world is getting younger and younger. And as is reflected in this room, most people alive today were born after 1950. What does that mean? It means that most of you have lived your entire lives in an absolutely unprecedented and an absolutely unsustainable period of growth and change. But that's all you've ever known. To you, that's normal. And so to you, because our lives are short, that's got to be what we have to perpetuate. And if we don't have, you know, if I can't go to a Walmart's and find 50,000 new things tomorrow, I'll go nuts. I mean, we want change. We want more stuff. Because we are living through this absolutely abnormal period, and that's all you've ever known. So there's a, a perceptual distortion then that results as more and more people are born in this uh, strange period of time. Science itself, I believe, has been responsible for shattering the world. Science, ever since Isaac Newton's time, has looked out at the universe as a giant machine. Isaac Newton called it a clockwork mechanism. And the idea was that if the universe is, is like a giant machine, then if you focus on the parts, the rings, the, the, the springs, the cogs, the wheels, the nuts and bolts, and know how all of the parts work, then eventually you'll be able to fit it back together and recreate the universe. That's called reductionism. You focus, you reduce your vision to the smallest part of nature, whether it's a subatomic particle, an atom, uh, a molecule, a cell, or an organism. You attempt to, to, to understand that bit of nature. And that's what modern science, well, mainly biology, biotechnology, uh, uh, medicine, continue to operate on the reductionist idea. Early in the, 19th, uh, the 20th century, physicists realized Isaac Newton was dead wrong. It doesn't work. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the reasons, but just let me say that, that it quickly became obvious that you could study all of the properties, the physical properties of atomic hydrogen and all of the properties of atomic oxygen. But if you then ask a physicist, what happens when you take two atoms of hydrogen, put them together with one atom of oxygen to make a molecule of water, what will be the properties of H2O? A physicist has to say, I'll be damned if I know. Because physicists understand those parts interact. And there are what physicists call emergent properties. There are new properties that come out of the collective that don't exist in the individual parts. So the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The reductionist approach doesn't work. But for the vast bulk of biologists, especially in my area of genetics, scientists are focused on parts, and they really believe they can reconstruct the world by putting together the pieces. They've never come to understand synergy and emergent properties.